please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. More charges of sexual harassment in the entertainment industry. Some media giants are taking action. Julia Borson has the latest out of Los Angeles. Julia? Hey, Kelly, the latest in the Hollywood harassment fallout, Netflix, is pulling Louis C.K.'s upcoming stand-up special. Louis C.K. responding to allegations in the New York Times of sexual misconduct, saying, quote, these stories are true, going on to say, I have spent my long and lucky career talking and saying anything I want. I will now step back and take a long time to listen. Netflix saying, quote, the allegations made by several women in today's New York Times about Louis C.K.'s behavior are disturbing. Louis' unprofessional and inappropriate behavior with female colleagues has led us to decide not to produce a second stand-up special as had been planned. Now, this is on the heels of Kevin Spacey facing allegations of sexual assault, fired from House of Cards, and also disinvited from an HBO comedy special, and in an unprecedented move, edited out of a movie called All the Money in the World, which is scheduled for release on December 22nd. Sony's TriStar is replacing Spacey with Christopher Plummer, doing reshoots and using visual effects. The studio is saying, quote, there are over 800 other actors, writers, artists, craftspeople, and crew who work tirelessly and ethically on this film, some for years, including one of cinema's master directors. It would be a gross injustice to punish all of them for the wrongdoings of one supporting actor in the film. This, of course, is a massive undertaking to change this film with just six weeks before it's scheduled to be released. Back over to you. And I'm, you know, for Netflix, the big deal for them, too. I mean, I don't know how much uh, we don't have the ratings on his comedy specials, but, uh, you know, they're not hesitating to pull the plug. Yeah, it's interesting, Kelly, when you really see these companies doing the calculation and it's not worth it for them to be affiliated with people facing these kinds of allegations. And so it's it's really better for them to cut the cord, even if it costs a lot of money. I would presume that these reshoots for the Sony movie are going to be incredibly expensive, but they think it's worth it. And look, it might even drive more interest in the film for people to see what it looks like when you replace a character so close to a release date. Yeah, I was wondering that, too. Julia, thank you. Julia Forston. <laughs> Time now for a CNBC News update. Let's get back to Contessa Brewer. Contessa? Hi there, Kelly. Here's what's happening right now. Al Gore is attending UN climate talks in Germany, and he says more than 100 businesses in the United States are committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and that will maintain the U.S. allegiance to the Paris Climate Accord. Under the legal terms of the Paris Agreement, as some of you know, the first date on which the U.S. could actually legally withdraw coincides with the day after the next presidential election in 2020. Ivanka Trump joined Senator Susan Collins on the stage in Maine to talk about tax reform. Ivanka says the bill is a key to the president's goals of growing the economy and helping the middle class. Collins says she favors income tax reform and relief, but is not ready to back the Senate proposal. Two Chicago lawmakers are proposing a city ordinance that would fine people for texting or talking on the phone while crossing the street. The fines would range from $90 to $500. That's a whopper. A similar bill went into effect in Honolulu last month. But, you know, if it saves lives, priceless. Right, Kelly? Look, I know Chicago just needs the revenue, but I love this. Yeah. I, I wish everyone would. I wish they'd adopt this nationally. It, just, I, it seems it's like a no-brainer, but you, you shouldn't have crossing the street. The fines would range from $90 to $500. That's a whopper. A similar bill went into effect in Honolulu last month. But, you know, if it saves lives, priceless. Right, Kelly? Look, I know Chicago just needs the revenue, but I love this. Yeah. I, I wish everyone would. I wish they'd adopt this nationally. It, just, I, it seems it's, like it's, a no-brainer, but you, you shouldn't have to tell people to put down their phones while they're crossing a the street. Yeah, but you do. You have to tell I them. I want to impose they this law right in, in my apartment. <laughs> my daughter is forever bumping into things. <laughs> that, too. Contessa, thank you. Sure. You could raise some money that way. Uh, let's take a look at how we finished the day on Wall Street. Uh, the Dow closed lower by about 39 points. The S&P was down two. Both of those indexes snapping their eight-week winning streak. The Nasdaq was up less than a point on the bell. So was the Russell 2000, which remains well below its early October closing high. Let's get to some of the other big stories today in our rapid recap. <laughs> What we will no longer do is enter into large agreements that tie our hands, surrender our sovereignty, and make meaningful enforcement practically impossible. State and local deductibility has been in place since 1913. It has been something agreed upon by Democrats and Republicans throughout. 
Once it is gone, you will never see it again. Disney shares dipped after missing expectations on both the top and bottom line, but the stock then turned positive during Disney's earnings call. Our plan on the Disney side is to price this substantially below where Netflix is. We have a chance to make uh, you know, 20 times the money over the next 15 years. Old Bon Pen and its acquisition is not about me. It's a powerful strategic acquisition that enables Panera to do an even better job in hospitals, universities, and transportation centers. Alibaba Singles Day is now well underway. The company's saying they hit sales of $5 billion in the first 15 minutes. Things are off to a very rapid start. This year we expect it's going to be a much bigger uh, event given that we've got 140,000 brands participating. Although I guess we're supposed to stop calling it Singles Day because it's yeah. for everybody to experience. I used to work with Mike Evans. I, now I see what he's doing. <laughs> Interesting. You're going to go join up with him? I'm not, I'm not going to China. Yeah. You, want the, you see I'm, that uh, big tank with the crabs? Yeah, I'm, I think I'm going <laughs> to I can get crabs here in Chinatown or something like that. <laughs> Uh, let's get to the takeaway, <laughs> shall we? Uh, we begin today uh, with a major setback for Uber over in the UK. A labor tribunal rejected Uber's argument that its drivers are self-employed, so Uber will have to treat them as employees entitled to minimum wage and paid time off. This after London barred Uber altogether back in September. Will this damage Uber's prospects to go public by 2019, which the CEO just yesterday said is his goal? Uh, I don't know if this one in itself will damage uh, those prospects, but if it broadens out from here, I mean, even some states in the United States, States have had some uh, kind of friction when it comes to all this. I, I, I don't know if it, it doesn't implode the business model, but of course they're already kind of uh, this soft ban but or it, preliminary it ban. It certainly in endangers anyway. the business model somewhat if you yes. have to now treat them as employees, uh, Evan. Until they get to be an autonomous okay. transportation <laughs> yes, network. Which is why they're yeah. pushing I'm not the advisor to Uber, but if I was the advisor to the CEO, I would tell him, you know what, just be quiet for the next six months nine months just run the business don't talk about ipos don't talk what's wrong with them saying they want to go public by 2019 because i think yeah. i think it creates it that becomes a story instead of running the business well and profitable. it's a distraction are they are it's, it's distraction and and cause then everything comes and gets seen in the light of the ipo instead of running the business right now we're having the discussion what is it about oh is it good for the ipo is it bad for the ipo yeah but i it think should be about is it good for the business or bad my takeaway from this whole episode with all the drama and all the turmoil at the top is that the business runs itself it's at a point where the app is the app. I want to see the drivers are part of the. That's network. why I wish they okay. were public. Next, the price of Bitcoin has been whacked a thousand dollars off its high in the last couple of days, while the price of Bitcoin Cash has been surging. Uh, some say that's because Cash offers lower transaction fees. Meanwhile, the SEC is talking like it considers most initial coin offerings to be securities now and thus subject to their laws. Guys, is the crypto bubble popping? The nature of bubbles, if it is a bubble, is that it seems like it's going to pop. Dozens of times before it does. Honestly, yeah. Yeah. what's the right price? I mean, there isn't a correct price. It feels price. to me like we have not hit mania yet. There's been. It's, it's, it's in the process, seemingly. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the thing. I think as long as there is a market for people to launder money, tax, evade taxes, and want to do transactions outside the purview of the law or sovereign governments, there will be a market for that. How you put a price on what that market is. You think I don't. Know. Yeah, I mean that's the ultimate kind of like most committed end user, arguably. But right now, this price has hit escape velocity beyond the size no, no, of that activity. No, no, I, I understand. It's all about. All I'm saying is, as long network. as you have guys like your your friend Bill Miller, and you got a lot of Wall Street He's guys had and an hedge incredible friends. Incredible year. No, no, but they had an incredible year because this is exactly the kind of momentum play that he he. Go, piles into uh, he has whether, a whole argument for why Bitcoin. I, by the way, everybody can give you an argument, and that's the way the all bubbles operate. There's always an argument the, behind uh, it. There's always the, an argument. Is the amount of implied energy use for a basic transaction? Yeah, it's a good it's, point. It's just it's a good off point. the charts. It's very high. Yeah. Uh, finally, Russian fake news may be manipulating energy markets. Facebook, Twitter, and Alphabet's Google are giving information to Congress, according to Bloomberg, in a probe of Russian anti-fracking and anti-fossil fuel ads. Now. Here's my question. Even if those, if that was happening, does that amount to manipulating the energy market? That was exa my exact question. I mean, basically putting propaganda out there about a political position that may or may not be inferred as bearish for a, an asset market. I mean, market. by that I you mean, could say that Greenpeace was manipulating energy Yeah, markets. exactly. I mean, I, exactly. I, don't know if the I mean maybe is... they want to get at just the magnitude of the efforts to spread disinformation, but that's separate from a, a market manipulation. Or does this go to Twitter's recent announcement that it's going to make it transparent? Who funded every ad on its page? If the argument is, look, you know, you don't know yeah. 
that it's Russia that's against fracking, but if you did, you'd take that and add information differently? Perhaps that's it. But yet, yeah, again, I see that's still a leap to get to a true market manipulation type charge. I mean, no, yet another reason why I so do not like the world of social media <laughs> and what goes on there. You know, I, it's all, it's all, you know, you can Twitter away, Mike Santoli. <laughs> You know, you're a Twitter journalist. Away, you yes. can Twitter, Twitter away. away, Kelly Evans. Yes, I'm not Twittering. <laughs> uh, but we want your take on today's takeaway. And guess what? You can message us on Facebook, Twitter, or over email. We may read your response on air at the end of the show. Coming up, the Ways and Means Committee approving the House. The House and Senate have each come out with their own tax plans, and there are a number of differences, including how they handle deductions and raising questions about how to pay for the tax cuts. Investors are following these details closely. Could a final bill possibly even pass by the end of the year? Joining me now is Maddie Dupler, who's a senior fellow at the National Taxpayers Union, and Jimmy Pethokoukis, who's economic policy analyst at the American Enterprise Institute and a CNBC contributor. Welcome to you both. Hey. Maddie, what do you think for the prospects here? Um, is this bill going to get done, period? And, and how quickly can it get done? Hey, I'm excited. If I'd been sitting in this chair three weeks ago and you'd been asking me if you're we going to see a Senate bill, I don't think anyone would have agreed that we would see one by today. So the fact that the House Ways and Means Committee was able to pass their bill out of committee yesterday on the same day that the Senate released its chairman mark and is, full, is going straight ahead, I think really indicates really good momentum moving forward. I think we're still on time to see a bill potentially by the end of the year, which is an ambitious time scale, but still very much possible. Jimmy, you agree? Uh, they have some big decisions to make. There's been a lot of delayed decisions. I know uh, Secretary Mnuchin, like two seconds ago, j said he still thinks this thing's going to happen this year. Uh, they, let's just talk about the Senate for a moment. They don't have a bill. A bill means it is bird rule compliant, which means it doesn't increase deficits after 10 years. What they currently have dramatically increases deficits after 10 years, so they have to make some decisions. Something needs to be made temporary, whether it's the personal side or the business side, uh, and that is going to be highly controversial. So until they've made that big choice, uh, this is still more a concept than an actual piece of legislation that can be turned into a law. Maddie, is that a fair point? But listen, that process is moving. Yeah, that process is moving forward. It the Senate point. Finance Committee is a little different in that they, when they, re, when they release a mark, it's more of a conceptual document than it is legalese legislative language. But they're scheduled on Monday to start taking that ball and running with it. And you know there are a number of hard decisions that have to be made. But look at what you're seeing in the House Ways and Means Committee. That's a pretty diverse group of uh, of congressmen represented on the committee, and they were able to find consensus in their document after marking it up for a week. So I think you'll see that in the finance mark too. There's an opportunity. For for amendments, of course, and there will be differences. But this is also how the legislative process works. You're going to have a different product coming out of the Senate than the House, and they're going to need to figure out where that axe is going to fall. Let, let me let like me say what the legal ease that, that legal yeah. that legal ease is. Uh, are we going to have a 20 percent rate? Are we going to have a 25 percent? Are we going to have a 30 uh, percent? Is is it going to be temporary? Is it going to be phased? These aren't minor details, considering that the corporate tax cut is the is supposed to be the living beating heart of this tax bill. And we're not sure what that is. So that, 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 is, something, that is a key no, detail I, that is I, I still just, up I in the air. No, I disagree with you there. No, I disagree with you there. I think me, a couple things me, we do know. Let me, let me ask you both the question. Y yes or no? R quick All yes right. or no. Will what comes out at the end of the day achieve the objective of juicing the GDP growth rate to 4% or so, like they claim it's going to be? Is it enough to do what they say it's going to do, or is it just going to end up getting caught in the business cycle and not doing anything? No, I don't think. I, I think you're. I'm not going to argue I think you're that we're about gonna... a third of a. Go ahead. Go ahead, Maddie. Go ahead. I think it's okay, going to so go about third of a percentage point. I don't know if we're to four. We will certainly. <laughs> <laughs> we have a delay. Go ahead, Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy, you go. Okay, I think we're. I think we're talking about maybe a quarter of a percentage point. Uh, I think you do have some business cycle issues. The Fed's going to have a vote. So I think maybe uh, 4%, I think if it got anywhere near 3%, I think that would have been an incredible achievement. I don't think that's what we're going to see. Maddie? I think what we've, what we've seen so far is less than 2% growth, so we can't be doing any worse, right? But I do think that any kind of tax reform coming out of the House and Senate is going to juice the economy. Getting to 4 would be great, but we are going to see a corporate income tax rate come down. I think we're going to get to 20. That's something that you found consensus on from both House, Senate, and especially from the President. He's given a ton of direction on wanting to get to the 20% rate. I think we're going to see 20, and I think you'll see a cascading effect of booming economic growth 
growth as a result. We don't need stimulus. We need deep structure reform. We don't need stimulus. <laughs> we need both. I think that if we see tax no, reform, that's certainly not going to hurt the situation. We need deep situation. structure reform, Eddie. As we're like, uh, we're like 10 years into this recovery. We're at near full employment. We don't need fiscal stimulus. I think the Fed will say the same thing. We're I certainly think that we need businesses that are competitive in a global economy, and right now we're at a 35% rate, which is 10 percentage points higher than the OECD average. You can't tell me that our businesses are doing the best that they can do. They're, uh, they're getting as much profit and as much ability to invest back into their workers here. With the business climate environment and the tax code, is making it impossible for businesses to compete here and abroad. Jimmy, last well, word. Uh, I, I listen, just don't, don't, don't expect 3 and 4% growth out of this. Keep your expectations modest, and you won't be disappointed. <laughs> All right, there's your answer. I, I remain guys. I, Why I, not? I mean, I, 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 I agree with Jimmy. And by the way, the idea that big U.S. corporations who are right now paying nowhere near 35%, the fact that they are. They're, no, they're not. Yeah, no, they're, the domestic no, oriented the world, ones the are. Yes. Lead, the world beaters are not paying that. But the point is, the after tax profit margins have been at historic highs yes. for years. Yes. And when this economy was growing much faster, corporate taxes were at the same rate as they are All now. Right. So, it's, I'm not sure that's Yeah, but we need the wages to grow, fact. too, and that's what tax reform can do. <laughs> She's still fighting. Uh, Maddie, thank you very much. Maddie Dumpler, Jimmy <laughs> Petakoukas. Thanks, uh, guys. Good debate. Appreciate it. Uh, General Electric, widely underperforming the broader market over the past two years, but still paying out $8 billion in dividends per year. Could that be on the chopping block at the company's investor day on Monday? The potential impact on the stock is coming up. Also ahead, Bitcoin had that wild week. A one Wall Street Journal editor, we know him, uh, says the cryptocurrency is about to get even more volatile. He'll tell us why tonight on Fast. General Electric is holding its Investor Day Monday, where we could find out whether the company plans to cut its dividend. Morgan Brennan has a preview. Morgan? Hey, Kelly, that's right. So after four months of limbo, many questions. Wall Street will want answered by General Electric come Monday. The biggest, the dividend. Is it going to get cut? CEO John Flannery himself called the cash flow, quote, horrible. So the expectation increasingly is it will. Now, to put that scenario in perspective, the last time GE cut its dividend was 2009 during the recession. The only other time since 1899, 1939, during the Great Depression. So this would be a big deal. But it may be necessary with the struggling industrial down about 35 percent this year and businesses like uh, its biggest power now waning. Other big topics, new profit guidance. GE still technically has a $2 per share target for 2018, though analysts have disregarded that for months now. Current consensus on the street, $1.14 for next year. Other questions. What will comprise Flannery's pledged $20 billion in divestitures? Transportation, health care, lighting, Baker Hughes. These are some of the names that have been kicked around. It's got a hefty debt load to counter. And how much deeper will the cost cuts and the layoffs go as well? Just today, Reuters reporting layoffs in GE Digital tied to the Predix industrial operating system. That has been an area of investment in recent years, sort of seen as the next generation thing for GE. So a lot on tap from Flannery, as well as new CFO Jamie Miller, also the GE Aviation CEO and the new Power CEO as well. All of this starts 9 a.m. Eastern on Monday. Meantime, Shares of GE actually rallied today. They closed the week higher, though they are still down more than 20 percent since Flannery announced this upcoming event back in July, right before he took the helm as CEO. Kelly? All right, Morgan, thank you. I mean, you have to say for John Flannery, he gave a very candid interview to David Faber uh, speaking about the company's challenges. So yeah. is it should he go ahead and just kind of scrap all of those targets that she mentioned? and clean the slate. I think that's what everyone expects is going to have a complete reset. Um, I think the dividend, I think it would almost be a disappointment if they maintain the dividend at this point because it does mean that they're not really tearing it down to build it back up. Uh, the dividend hasn't protected you at all if you're a shareholder right now. I mean, obviously, a lot of people True. depend on it uh, for income, and that's a, a big part of the shareholder base. But stock's down 50 percent. You know, that 4 percent dividend yield didn't really help you. Yeah, I would uh, say, you know, a lot of, and Morgan's whole discussion, is the way Wall Street looks at GE. And I would say, if I were CEO, I'd focus on the businesses. Because I think this is a company that for years and years has been run. But those businesses are a big part of the problem. I understand, but they've been run for years and years like a financial conglomerate to serve Wall Street. And, yeah. they, and they're very numbers-oriented, and I would like them to be a little more 
business oriented than numbers oriented. Plus, they get rid of all that advertising. They do they do too much TV advertising. I like, like the ad with the feel, guy, though. Yeah, but by the way, it's all this feel good advertising. Know, it's like corporate right. umbrella advertising. Right. They don't need that. You can slash that. Button. I don't think that's exactly their main problem. <laughs> I, did I say that? Oh, it's stocks down by a third. If it's Friday, it's time for the closing bell mailbag. We'll read some of your messages right after this.